Storytellers, it's Jay Shear here from the Fantasy Storytelling YouTube channel and the Story Geeks. And today we're going to look at how to format a screenplay relative to dialogue. Um, we're going to start with Knives Out. Knives Out is a fantastic script. The script's by Ryan Johnson. So this is a really interesting thing that he does in Knives Out. He does it throughout Knives Out, and I like it a lot. Um, you'll notice that we're uh, in the interior of the Cabrera kitchen, and it's morning. And here's something that um, you don't see a lot of. Well, I guess it depends on what script you're reading, but I like this a lot. He does this a lot in this script, and it's kind of fun. So you're always going to see script uh, dialogue in a script generally be you know centered, and it's usually so you can tell that it's dialogue. And I think the the main reason for doing that is so that when people are flipping through the script, especially actors or directors who are using the script to work with actors. Um, or the actors knowing their, what their lines are, it's easy for them to find their lines. Um, and then check this out. Ryan Johnson does this thing where he includes two people talking at the same time. And that's pretty cool because it's basically signifying that in real life, we do hear people having a conversation at the same time. And so now that's what the actual script shows up looking like that and then the actors know kind of how to play off each other which is really cool so just wanted to showcase that to you um i use i'm currently using slugline as my um formatting screen screenwriting software and i don't know if it allows you to do this or not i bet you it does i bet you there's a way to do it i haven't looked it up yet so this is kind of a more advanced technique that you might have to look up how your screenwriting software handles it in order to put it into your script so just something that something to definitely check out there you'll notice that marta is going to answer the phone so alice hugs her sister marta's phone rings it's walt thromby okay so marta it's harlan's son is what she says to the family who are in the room then she answers and says hi walt listens and says uh-huh okay usually I prefer for these things, if they're action related, I prefer for them to actually be action. So notice how this is broken up, right? This is all Marta talking and she's talking on the phone. And well, the first line's not on the phone, but you, you get you, you get my, uh, my intention here. So I would like it better if it says it's Harlan's son, then in the action describe, she picks up the phone or she answers the phone, then, then says, hi, Walt. She pauses. Now, I might put a pause actually in the dialogue and say listens. But the answers, I don't think I'd say answers because I like to keep the action and description out of the dialogue. I don't think it makes sense to include them both there. I understand why they're doing that because this is a phone call, but I probably would not have formatted it this way. But I do think if you're gonna have her pause to listen, that is something that you could put in the dialogue because the actor is basically just gonna pause, right? Now, if you wanted to say, now notice what he does here, what Ryan Johnson does here is when he needs her face to show an expression, he actually moves that back into the action as opposed to saying confused here, right? And so now it tells the, in this case, the actress, it tells her, you need to have a confused look on your face when you're hearing this information that's being given to you. So you can see how you can put some of this stuff in the dialogue or you can take some of this stuff and put it in the actions. There are technically actions. Even listening is technically an action. So I wanna get into that some more as we go through some of these scripts because that can be confusing to new screenwriters. And a lot of people, it's a stylistic thing about where they choose to put those things. I personally like keeping actions completely separate. You'll notice also just really quickly that, and a lot of screenwriting software will do this automatically for you, but since Marta is continuing speaking past the action, it'll just add a continued here. and just means that this person is continuing to speak through the action. So here is a better example of how I would use these parenthetical statements that appear underneath the characters regarding the dialogue that they're about to speak to. In this case, this is identifying who Marta is speaking to. And we need to know who Marta is speaking to because we need to understand from a script perspective 
what the tone is, how the actress is going to deliver this line, because we need to know, you know, obviously it matters who she's speaking to. And you wouldn't put that in the action. It doesn't make as much sense to put that in the action. So I like using to the cop in this case when it's when it's unclear who the person would be speaking to. Also, this is another good one. This is basically saying we need when Meg says this line, when the actress playing Meg says this line, she needs to mutter this line. So I like that. I like those two clarifications. They're not action. They are literally clarifications for how the lines are supposed to be delivered. In this case, who the line is going to be delivered to, because there's a lot of characters in this scene. And then in this case, how the line specifically would need to be delivered. There's a lot of ways to deliver this line. And uh, you d- going to be careful that you don't take the creativity of how an actor or actress might be able to deliver their line completely out of their ability to come up with an interpretation. But in some cases you have to, because it doesn't make you have to, this has to be muttered. Um, obviously they're talking at the same time. So if she like yells this, if all of a sudden the, the actress was to interpret this as something that, that um, she should be yelling, then she would completely overtake this line of dialogue. And that's not what's intended. So just knowing that. Also, this is a kind of an this is a kind of an interesting one too. This one is kind of like a really in between gray area one because it's not really action and it's not really um, it's not really how she's delivering the line. But Marta says, uh, "Not very good alone. Lots of just this," and she's referring to the crying. Um, and that's kind of an interesting. I, I hadn't actually seen that before. Um, of all the scripts that I've read, I can't remember someone saying in the script like describing the thing that they're talking about without saying what they're doing and that's cool it's like the good subtext and stuff i like that a lot so that's kind of a cool way of, of handling that all right so now let's get into another thing that you will find in a lot of dialogue for formatting dialogue and that is voiceovers and so in this scene this is the interior of a living room it's the night of the party and there's a flashback this is a flashback sequence So voiceover. So this is a conversation that's happening, not with people who are on screen, but rather who people who are having this conversation in a different setting. But, but this is a really skilled technique because sometimes if people are just having a conversation, but there could be visuals added that would be what that would make this conversation more interesting, then you would actually show something else while this conversation is unfolding. So this could be, for example, more expository in nature. It's more exposition telling about what happened. But if you add visuals to that exposition, that makes things more interesting, especially if we see like, what if what if uh, Linda was lying about what was actually going on and we as the audience saw what was actually going on, but heard Linda lying about it. Anyways, just kind of interesting stuff that you can play with as a screenwriter. But voiceover basically means that a character is speaking over the scene who is not in the scene. Um, another thing that we're gonna take a look at is off screen or off camera. That would indicate that a character is in the scene, but not uh, within the frame of what the camera is focused on. So this is just voiceover, two people having a conversation about the night of the party, which is this flashback, and we're seeing what happens the night of the party while these two characters talk to one another. I also wanna point out that I really love this. Usually these parentheticals are again, how to deliver the line. So we saw like earlier it was muttered sometimes uh, a lot of times if the, if the actor knows how the character is supposed to feel based on the emotion of the scene, you don't need to clarify for them how they're feeling, but every once in a while you will do that because you want to note to them that there's a change in the scene or there's a change in the character dynamic that you didn't put into the action. And therefore the only way to know that that occurred was to tell them kind of, how to deliver the line and in this case uh saying wow is really cool because it's like like now the actor can interpret whoever's playing lieutenant elliot can interpret like what would wow be like and in this case like his mom how old is she you know so it's kind of kind of cool i i like that i think that's a very very good way of doing that so here's another area where i probably would have handled this a little bit differently but again stylistically ryan johnson's probably one of the best screenwriters in the business right now so whenever i say something like that it's easily like dude if you want to copy ryan johnson probably better than copying me right um but uh lieutenant and i say that because i am very much a fan of practitioners who are doing something amazing paying attention to them as opposed to to a more academic form of (laughs) pulling things off. If you can practice something 
that breaks some of the the academic rules of the trade, but you're awesome at it, then do that. Knowing you're breaking the rules and knowing why you're breaking the rules. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, it needs to be something that everyone understands. A story conveys emotion and entertains and causes us to think deeper and causes us to feel emotions. Um, all of the rest of this stuff is just formatting. Who cares? I mean, I say formatting, who cares? Obviously I'm doing a series on it, so it should be noted, but it's only so that we can tell a better story. Okay. So, so I'll get off my soapbox there for a second and get back to the script. Um, so this makes a lot of sense sharp. So she's saying this. And again, I really like Ryan Johnson's use of, instead of saying like, he could say ex like describe the emotion. So excited, angry, uh, annoyed, frustrated. That's what you see a lot in parentheticals, but what he says is sharp. And that's kind of a cool, cause it gives even more clarity into how this character is, is dealing with this scene or this situation. This is the part where I probably would not handle it this way. You'll notice that it says it's my company. And then he goes to Lieutenant Elliot checks notes. Sorry. Right. I probably would have put a line of action that said Lieutenant Elliot glances at his notes and then you would not need this here i feel like usually when writers put the parentheticals in the dialogue i think what they're trying to do is save space on the page or a lot of actors will actually skip the actions uh, i have a feeling that directors do it too but they'll skip the actions and goes straight to the dialogue. And so in order to signal to them that they were supposed to do something, this doesn't, this, this could be done by itself, right? Sorry, right. Could be done by itself, but he's trying to say like, no, 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 you need to check your notes and then clarify that you already had that information. Um, I would, it would be preferable to me if this was an action he did, Lieutenant Elliot did, and then said this, um, and that the parentheticals were left to how you say it as opposed to what you're doing. Okay, here is an example of off screen. And I tend to use off screen instead of off camera, um, but technically they're sort of saying the same thing. Um, you'll notice here that Ryan Johnson uses off screen as well. So interior hallway, the day of the party, a caterer walks through with a platter, pauses, hears shouting through the wall. Now this is, uh, Blanc telling a story. So he's saying Harlan shouted the phrase. That's a voiceover because what we're indicating as a writer or what Ryan Johnson is indicating as a writer is that Blanc is telling the story. And so he's not in this scene. He's not around. He's not, he's not related to things that are occurring the day of the party. But then we see Harlan say off screen, so OS off screen. If it were off camera, it'd be O C handled in the same way. O dot C dot and period. Um, you, you tell her or I will. So basically this is saying Blanc is telling the story. His is a voiceover cause he's not in this scene. Technically Harlan is in this scene, but uh, but since we're hearing shouting through the wall, we know that he's not, he's not in that specific room. He's in the scene because the dialogue is occurring. His dialogue is occurring in that room because it's coming through the wall, but he's not on camera. And so therefore he's off screen. So basically that's the way of looking at those two. It's kind of a perfect example of those two together. I notice here that in this voiceover, um, Ryan is using an underline, so this one right here, this uh, underlining down um, for emphasis, as if the character probably is supposed to say, by someone coming down the stairs, right? I usually tend to use italics, and that's probably coming from a prose background where I've written fiction, literary fiction before. So that's something interesting to note is that he's using an underline there. This is kind of cool because um, this is showcases another technique that I, s I have seen writers use before. And that is that sometimes you'll want an actor to pause. And a lot of times actors will add their own pauses and figure out how to deliver lines in a way that makes a lot of sense in that regard in terms of who should pause and when. In this case, 
the writer is indicating that there should be a long pause. And so there, what Ryan has done is he's put in beat, meaning that a beat passes. And nothing else is necessarily happening here, which is why you don't see an action. You don't see Blanc pausing. He doesn't say Blanc pauses to, you know, light his cigarette or something, right? It just says beat, meaning that the actor is supposed to take a long pause here before continuing to deliver this line. Here's another technique that I have used myself that I like using, and that is um, you'll see here that this is a voiceover. So again, we're flashing back and someone's talking over the scene, in this case, Harland. Walt and Jacob are smoking outside. They'll see you and then dot, 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 because the next time we're going to change the scene, the scene has changed, but Harlan is still speaking over this. So you'll see that it is continued, uh, meaning that dot, dot, dot through the glazed window is in reference to this up here. Walt and Jacob are smoking outside. They'll see you through the glazed window. Right, so he's just finishing that sentence, but the actual scene in front of us has changed slightly. One thing I highly recommend is to read scripts written by great writers. Ryan Johnson is a great writer, so you definitely should check out his scripts. And in this case, I think he did a phenomenal job. One last thing I'll take a look at before we jump into um, my script is just one of the ways he's handling a character yelling. There's a couple ways to handle this. Obviously, you could say, make a parenthetical statement saying that this character is yelling, but we in the action, he says, Walt yells at a non-responsive, bored, great Nana. And in this case, he's just using all capital letters to signify that Walt is essentially yelling at uh, this great Nana. So do you want dinner, Nana? Dinner to eat, eat. And, and he's saying that really, really loud. And so therefore he has done all caps. Kind of cool. Now we're gonna take a look at um, a film, a short film that I'm currently working on called Ravenous. And um, it's interesting because this has already been, we've already made some decisions about this film where this character is gonna be um, female. So technically her name will be La Nina instead of El Nino, which is kind of funny. But um, you'll notice I just talked about a character talking loudly or shouting and this is how I handled that in my script, which is to say that I made a parenthetical saying shouting. It would be similar to how Ryan Johnson used mutters in the previous example that we just took a look at. This I'm saying, this is gonna be delivered as if this character is shouting. I could make all of these cap, but I don't know that that's necessary. So just something to, to, to think about. How you wanna make note that a character is yelling, you have some options available to you. This is a case where, you know, I have a prose background, so I tend to like to insert some extra information that I feel like would be visually appealing in action or description. And there are probably other ways that other screenwriters would handle this. So we have this character, Deckard, who's a sheriff, and he says, you're the infamous El Nino, huh? Then we get a shot of the young man who is El Nino, staring back and then nodding. And then Deckard says, you're young. El Nino raises an eyebrow as if questioning why that matters. And then Deckard, you sure you wanna do this kid? This one, it, uh, it ain't normal. Now, let's just pretend for a second that this was El Nino talking and he was gonna raise his eyebrow. Some writers could put that raising the eyebrow note in a parenthetical statement here. Raise his eyebrow. Why does that matter? Or something along those lines. Again, I don't like doing that. Um, here, here's some tension. I'm gonna I'll talk about a little bit. Of, this is a much longer video about uh, dialogue formatting than I thought. But um, I think that there's some tension, un, undiscussed, unreferenced tension in the industry. I have worked with actors before who have legitimately been like, hey, we're not gonna read screen description. Let's just go through all the dialogue in the script. And um, as somebody who comes from a predominantly prose background, who when I started to learn about writing scripts visually, I started to think to myself, well, I don't wanna use dialogue to explain what's going on. I wanna use um, action and description to explain what's going on visually. And that means that I started to cut as much dialogue out of my films as I possibly could. Um, I'm still not 
the best writer with subtext because subtext is uh, something I can talk about in another video. But subtext is when you let actors um, and the situation and the visuals descri basically describe uh, what's going on in the scene and how a character is feeling or what a character is leaving out or leaving in as opposed to the dialogue doing that. I'm not great at subtext, which means I sometimes overdo it with the dialogue and the dialogue tends to be a little bit more what they call on the nose. On the nose basically means you're just telling people in the dialogue what you, how you want them to feel or how you want them to think. But I will say one of the things I've gotten a lot better at, it's not related to subtext, is writing visuals so that a character doesn't need to say any words whatsoever. That the visuals will tell the story without a character ever needing to speak. The problem with that is that I think a lot of actors, when they approach a script, they want to make sure that they're memory, memorizing their dialogue. They want to make sure that they're, they're getting their dialogue down right and that they can concentrate on what, what it is they're saying. And so I think that that's why some of the actions that technically I think should not be in a parenthetical statement in the dialogue work their way into parenthetical statements and dialogue is because the, basically the screenwriters are going, well, if they don't see this, if they kind of ignore that this is in there, then there's a specific action that would be good to showcase in the film that matters to the story that they would not pick up on. So that's my assumption for why some of that stuff happens. I think I've worked with some actors, some really great professional actors who will just sort of skim through the action and look specifically for the dialogue. So I'm just letting you know that that is a thing that exists that's out there and may be some of the reason why this occurs in screenplays. I think that that should do it for the dialogue explanations um, from today. Again, I tend to use Slugline. I will include some links down below to other screenwriting software that you could you could invest in. I know um, Final Draft is sort of the industry standard, so a lot of people use Final Draft. I'll leave. We actually have an affiliate link for that, so if you purchase Final Draft through our affiliate link, we get a kickback, which is fantastic. So if you're up for that, please do that. Uh, but yeah, this is basically the formatting for dialogue. If I missed anything or if you have any specific questions relative to how to format your screenplay as it relates to dialogue, um, please ask me in the comments down below. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. We're all about helping people produce, write and produce their very own science fiction and fantasy stories. And um, if you want some more information or if you want to join a group of people who cares deeply about this kind of stuff, about the craft of storytelling, then check out The Story Geeks, both our podcast, which you can find anywhere you find podcasts, The Story Geeks podcast, and also check out our club, The Story Geeks Club. You can do uh, join the club for free on Facebook. Just search for The Story Geeks and ask to join. And then we also have some benefits for VIP uh, tier members. And the VIP members get this cool exclusive stuff, but also that's the best way to support the show as well. So thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. In the meantime, let me know if you have any questions down below. Thanks.